Hello, good evening. Welcome to I Care For Your Brain with Dr. Sullivan. That is me. We are here talking about neuropsychology. I am a person who very much values brain health education and feel very strongly that it needs to be evidence-based. We do not want to go on uh, hearsay. We do not want to go based on what corporate marketers want us to know. I want you to understand what the science has to say about a variety of different topics that should be important to you as someone who either has a brain health challenge or loves someone who has a brain health challenge. So every Wednesday at six o'clock we meet here for a free lecture. And what I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight is the difference between neurology and neuropsychology. A lot of you have seen a neurologist but I bet many of you have not seen a neuropsychologist. So I want you to understand the difference and why it really matters is because each specialist can offer you something different in your recovery. You might guess that I'm a little bit biased towards neuropsychology because that's what I chose to do. That's the specialty I've chosen to pursue. But I really chose to pursue it in a very mindful way because I believe it's the best tool to help people with brain health issues. So we are complementary neurologists and neuropsychologists, but we really do have some big differences. We have different educations. We evaluate brain functioning in two different ways. Again, complementary, but a little bit different. Our orientation is a little bit different, but like I said before, perhaps the most important thing is what role we can play in your recovery. So when you see a neurologist, they are considered to be a physician, a medical provider, and they have a MD after their name or a DO, and they go to medical school. This requires about four to five years worth of classes, a year of residency and a about two year supervised fellowship. And what this is, is you're practicing someone independently, but you have supervision from someone who has expertise and checks over your work, signs your notes, these kind of things. And they have a license to practice medicine. Neuropsychologists are different in the sense that we have either a PhD or something we call a PsyD. A PhD is actually a doctorate in philosophy of psychology and a PsyD is a doctor of psychology. So we too do about four to five years worth of classes. We do a one year internship and we do a two year fellowship and we also have a license to practice. So we go to school for about the same level of time. We engage in post doctoral education for about the same amount of time. Like I said before, your access to neurology much greater than your access to neuropsychology. Well, why is this? In part, this is because there's more of them. More people have specialty in neurology than they do special neuropsychology. It is um, the standard of care after you have, say, a stroke or a traumatic brain injury. Every year you need to see a specialist, a neurologist. And it's usually the neurologist who gets you to the neuropsychologist. And it really depends on the orientation of your neurologist if they value neuropsychology if they think that you would benefit from our expertise. And so one of the reasons I come on here on Facebook and do these lectures is because I want to empower you to decide for yourself if you think you would benefit from seeing one of us and to help you understand how to advocate for that referral. Both specialties are typically covered by most insurances. You usually have to wait a little bit longer for a neuropsych evaluation. If any of you have seen one of us in your recovery journey. You could chime in and let me know what the wait time was. Um, I have worked in places where the wait time was up to eight to nine months. I have also worked in places where in, in my current practice now, um, we are able to get people in within a few weeks with some of the doctors that work for me here in my practice. So if you go to see a you will have an initial appointment that is usually about a half hour to 45 minutes. And the focus is going to be on your physical examination. This is called the neuro exam. This is things like testing your reflexes, your strength, 
They may give you a brief cognitive exam. This is like, what year is it? Remember these three words. They order tests, neuroimages, things like MRIs, CT scans, tests that look at your brain waves, like an EEG. They might send for a test called an EMG, where they actually look at the conduction of your nerves in your arm for something like carpal tunnel. The focus really is on the organ of the brain and how it is working. Their job is to use their information to determine diagnosis and your medical treatment. Because they are physicians, they can prescribe you Now a neuropsychologist, how that appointment would be different, is really in our approach in what we value and in the time that we're really able to spend with patients. So our first appointment is the interview, which is always an hour. We then do much more comprehensive cognitive testing than a neurologist. So a neurologist is much more physical testing. The neurologist will actually touch you as part of the exam. The only touching that really happens in our exams is hopefully a hug at the end if we all feel like it went well. Um, you don't have to get into a hospital gown when you come to see a neuropsychologist. We spend that hour in the interview um, going very in depth with the way your symptoms started, the way they've changed over time, what other medical expertise you've had, what you know about your condition to date. And what we're really trying to do is to get insight into some of the that are gonna tell us about what's really going on under the surface. Many times it's much more than just one you know, pearl that we're looking for. We're really usually dealing with three or four, sometimes even eight or nine competing conditions that are influencing the person's ability to pay attention or their anxiety. There's oftentimes many factors. And what we're trying to figure out what type of testing we want to do with this person. So when a neuropsychologist does testing, they do testing. We do about three hours here in my clinic, mostly paper and pencil testing, sometimes computer testing, sometimes personality testing, or asking you questions about your mood. You know, everyone's depression is different. So some people have more emotional symptoms of depression. Some people have more physical symptoms. For some people, it's that brain fog type feeling. So as neurologists, we're respecting the neurology part in our unique way. And respecting the psychology part, how people are adapting and coping. And I'd like to think that our really on the person. The brain, of course, is a big part of what we do, but we're really kind of taking a more holistic approach and thinking, how is this person who has a brain? Sometimes people have issues that's not related to their brain at all. Um, sometimes it's a life circumstance, or uh, sometimes it's a medication that's affecting someone in a certain way. So we kind of take a much broader view on function, on quality of life, so we can try to sort through a lot of data to figure out what's going on. We cannot prescribe medications unless, as a neuropsychologist, you practice in New Mexico or Louisiana, and you've done a three-year, I believe, supervised fellowship that focuses on psychopharmacology. We can recommend class of medication back to our referring physician. So I often will say, I think this person from a antidepressant, say what the milligram should be and I can't even really say what specific type of antidepressant that they should get. I would say the most significant differences between neurology and neuropsychology or are that difference of testing. So neurology it's much more like a screen. So you're going to get a score. Um, what we fear is that people over or interpret the importance of the score because of course it's just a very brief snapshot into the person's brain for if the neurologist gives you three words to try to learn and remember, and in five minutes they come back around, what were those three words, and you're only able to give one, that is an important piece of information, but it's a very narrow piece of information. It may be that the person made a memory of those three words, but they have trouble with retrieval, and they cannot find those words quickly. That is a big difference between you told the person the three words and they literally didn't make a memory. It's as if they never heard it. You won't understand which one of those is true for that person unless you go on to test that information and in other, for example, recognition saying, you know, was that word tree? Yes or no. Was it Susan? Yes or no. And that's not usually a big part of screening measures. The other thing is it all depends on your personal context, how you do on these tests. If you're someone who was super smart, 
before your brain health challenge and now you do okay on the testing, someone who doesn't understand your whole life, your education, your baseline intelligence, they might actually give you a false negative. They might say, you know what, I think this person's doing just fine. Well, low average for that person who has a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, was a master you know, engine fixer, might not actually be an appropriate interpretation. Similarly, you might get someone who had a very profound learning disability their whole life and processing verbal information is not something that comes easy to them, but they are a genius with, you know, engines, like I said, gardening, mechanical things. You might also get a false positive where you might say, wow, this person, I think they really have dementia because they're really not doing well on some of these tasks. So as neuropsychologists, we cringe when we hear about because it's just this tiny little narrow window into someone's brain and too often if the evaluation stops there people get wrong diagnoses, correct diagnoses all the time in my office for better or worse sometimes people are told it's dementia Alzheimer's and it's not sometimes people are told it's normal aging and it's not so that's part of why you need to advocate is if you have a feeling about yourself or someone else and you don't feel like the doctor quite got it right and the evaluation was pretty darn shallow, I want you to know that neuropsychologists are out there and that we offer a much more comprehensive insight into brain functioning. So what we really care about with the testing is what we're inferring from the test score. So what do I mean by that? So we can actually do certain tests and we know that this part of the brain has to be working well in order to complete that test. So there's certain things you use your whole brain to do like pay attention, how quickly you can mentally process information. There's other tasks that we do like finding our words or comprehending language that is in a very specific part of the brain. So basically what we're doing with all these test scores, we usually give about 30 to 40 tests, is what we're really doing is pattern analysis. We are really trying to understand what is the over pattern that can almost give us a little tour around someone's brain and we can say wow you know this looks like something's happening in the frontal lobes or wow that uh, their spatial functioning their ability to perceive different lines of space wow that's really we know that's a parietal lobe function and our expertise is really figuring out what does that pattern mean there are patterns for normal aging there are patterns for alzheimer's depending on where the person had their stroke we can tell is it a cognitive disorder or is it more severe to be what we call vascular dementia so the test performances are one piece of our puzzle the interview how long that is how much information we get is another part we're also very much uh, record hounds we very much love to request all sorts of medical records because again we know that brain functioning is complex and until you understand so many different things, labs, a person's history of smoking, their history of you know, violence, uh, what their kidney functioning is. There's so many different things that can impact brain really information seekers. So if you come to us, be prepared to sign some releases so we can get recent hospital records, so we can track down that CT scan of your brain that was done seven years ago, because that's information, and information is what tells us what's going on with a person. So we are very much able to answer the question, is uh, a certain change in memory due to just getting older? Is that what's normal for this 80-year-old person? Or does it look and sound like it's the pattern of dementia? If it's dementia, what specific subtype of, of dementia is it? And you might wonder, okay, this is a big commitment. You know, four hours for neuropsychological evaluation. Really, at the end of the day, what's the point? What's the point is that you need and deserve and are owed this level of insight and analysis because it helps you get the diagnosis right and it helps us to personalize the brain health recommendations. That Memory medications do not work for every single person. We have to really make sure we understand what is going on with you specifically so we can give you specifically our very best recommendations what works for me might not necessarily work for you we also very much want people to be well educated in their unique brain health issue so many people do not understand their brain injury so many people with stroke don't know exactly where they had it they don't know why they had it and i 
believer in you need to become an expert as much as you can in your unique brain when you have a brain injury because you are going to be comforted by that knowledge. It's going to set you on a path of recovery. You're going to know exactly where you are in your recovery, how to make the steps to go forward. It's also important for me that you know and consider us partners in your mental health. Don't forget in our title, neuropsychology, psychology is the bigger word. At the end of the day, we are licensed mental health providers. So we really care about your emotional well being your adjustment to brain health dysfunction is very important to us and it can really have an impact on doing in everyday life. Some of the symptoms of depression, for example, like symptoms of dementia. There is something called pseudo dementia and it's when depression has gotten so bad that we actually start to think that person is in like someone with dementia, they are talking like someone with dementia, they're remembering very poorly, they don't have any motivation. And I get worried if we just label these people as dementia, we're not then going to strive to treat the treatable things that might actually pull out of it and get them better. We're also very good, I think, at telling you your next step. So for so many people, there is a sense when you're in the hospital, right after you have your brain injury, there's a lot of guidance. But the further you get out from having your diagnosis, oftentimes people feel kind of left behind. And so we like to see people, no matter how many years they are into their diagnosis or their recovery, and get them remotivated, get them back on a path of rehabilitation. And so we can tell you, you know, I really think that your hearing was affected, for example. I want you to go see this excellent audiologist because it might be that if you could just hear better, you might actually be less overwhelmed. You might be able to pay attention better. And I can tell that when I can account for your focusing, your memory is actually quite good. But in the quiet room with my you know, psychometrician, my testing assistant who can slow things down and it's just one-on-one -on -one and you can really focus on her. But that's not real life, is it? Real life is coming at you a mile a minute. And if you have a hearing issue, if your vision has been affected, it's very easy to get overwhelmed. And then what do we naturally do? We shut down. So that's a big part of neuropsychology is teasing apart complex things and not just kind of rolling everybody into the same. Who should see a neuropsychologist? Anyone with any type of brain health condition. If you've been diagnosed with Parkinson's, essential tremor, any type of vascular issue, a stroke, really even a TIA. If you have a family history of brain health issues, Alzheimer's, dementia, um, all sorts of things, and it worries you, then I really think you have a right to have one of these comprehensive evaluations that we offer as neuropsychologists. We will tell you how you're doing now. If you meet criteria for any diagnosis, even if you're doing great, you can consider our evaluation an excellent baseline for the future. If we see you now in 20 and we get to tell you you're doing great, well, then we also get to tell you hey, great, okay? When I see you again in three years, I want you to be doing this, this, and this because I can see there's these little risk factors that might pop up based on your medical issues, based on your mental health experiences, and I want you to stay and your brain to stay as good as you are doing in this moment. Two time points, two neuropsychological evaluations is the gold standard for determining cognitive decline. Even when I see people now for one-time evaluation and we can make estimates about their morbid functioning. And what I mean by that is there are tests that you will do as good on now, even if you have moderate stage Alzheimer's, than you would have when you were 25 years old. There's certain things the brain holds onto for a very long time until you're very advanced with your dementia. And we use those performances and things like how far you went in school and what kind of jobs you did to estimate what is normal for you. And that right? So you get all your test scores and we can say, what do we think is basically normal for this person and where are they now? When we do two neuropsychological evaluations separated by a year or more, that is primo. That's when we get to say we actually have data, objective numbers on how your functioning was and here's how you are now and what is the slope or the change between those two time points. So even if you think, you know what, I think I'm doing pretty good now, 
If you're worried, if you have any type of history of brain health challenge, I really would advocate for you to get a referral to a neuropsychologist. So you can go through primary care, you can go through neurology. If you feel like you could have some resistance there or you would like to know who we would recommend in your area, you can message us here on Facebook and we will, if you give us your zip code, we can actually give you the name and contact information for the nearest board certified neuropsychologist. And some of them I personally know just from being colleagues. So I want you to understand this beautiful profession of neuropsychology. I love it. I think it is the most helpful specialty area of medicine for all of you who are worried about your brain, who have been struggling with brain functioning. It's very detailed. And I think you would find a lot of us as providers to be very warm, compassionate people, probably because we're also drawn to psychology and the helping profession, uh, not necessarily just the medical profession. So this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. If you thought it was helpful or interesting, I would so appreciate sharing it on your Facebook page. We are always working hard to get active stroke recovery guide into people's hands. If you're someone who's had a stroke, you can go on our website, which is icfyb.com, icareforyourbrain.com backslash guide. And we have the stroke recovery guide up there for you. We are working really hard to get it into the hands of as many people who need it. Um, we might, we hope uh, to be making some exciting announcements in the next few weeks about some collaboration with different people across the United States to get it out there. Too many of you with stroke don't know what to do next. And we really took the question seriously about if you were to give someone a guide, what would be in it? And that's what we spent the last two years working on and it's finally out. We're so excited. So I care for your brain slash guide. I will be back next Wednesday at six o'clock and I very much appreciate your attention and your being with us here tonight. So have an excellent night and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.